Hello, and welcome to Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Colourgraph. Today, we're venturing back to the 17th century to investigate the secret histories embedded in a forgotten painting with one of America's great historians. Hello, I'm John Hillman. Picture this. It's 1643. The English Civil War is in progress. In his Oxford college, a young and sickly scholar sits in the gloom of his chambers. Beside him stands his tutor who leans against a globe. On a table before them both, a book lies open at the title page. A lesson is in progress. This is the scene that Professor John Heilbrun glimpsed a few years ago when he was visiting the National Trust property of Kingston Lacey in Dorset. This picture was hidden away on the top floor and it instantly engaged his attention. An expert in the history of astronomy and the work of Galileo, Heilbrun knew that there was more going on in this painting than initially met the eye. John Heilbrunn is Professor of History and the Vice-Chancellor Emeritus at the University of California, Berkeley, and he's Honorary Fellow of Worcester College in Oxford. In this episode of Travels Through Time, he talks to our very own Violet Moller about the story that emerged out of that tantalising painting, a story that is told in his new book, The Ghost of Galileo, in a forgotten painting from the English Civil War. I'd like to start by welcoming you to the podcast, Professor John Heilbrunn. It's an honour um, to be talking to you today. Over your distinguished career, you have written books on a very wide historical range of um, topics, mainly within the history of science, but your your breadth is very impressive. So can you tell us a bit about that, please? I can say that in my later years, I have decided I wanted to be a historian, having begun interested in the history of science owing to a misspent youth uh, studying physics. And uh, recently I have been more and more interested in general cultural history. And consequently, when I stumbled across the picture, which is the subject of the book that we will talk about, Mm -hmm. called The Ghost of Galileo, I was struck by uh, it as a commentary on the situation in which it was painted. Of course, it did have a connection with the history of science. And that is that the painting, which is the center of the book, contains a very odd reference to Galileo. The reference is a depiction, impressionistic depiction, of the title page of his famous book, which got him into trouble with the Inquisition. The title page, I say, but there's no title. So you had to know just the outlines of the drawing on that title page in order to be able to recognize that it was by Galileo. And so I wondered what it was doing in this picture when I found out that the picture was made at Oxford during the Civil War, so 1643, maybe 1644. I was doubly perplexed. So anybody who uh, was to be impressed by this picture must have known the frontispiece, the illustrated title page, by some other means. So what was it doing there in that painting? And secondly, who were these people who were supposed to know enough to recognize the image and to interpret it and that led to a merry chase and where did you um where did you come across the painting can you tell us that oh yes i should have mentioned uh, i was so full of this painting that i thought everybody must know where it is it's hanging uh in a stately home in dorset kingston lacey which is a property of the national trust and uh, it is still there up in a upper uh corridor where it is not always on view, depends on the number of uh, invigilators that they have uh, to keep an eye on the place. I'm hopeful that uh, a consequence of this book will be that that picture is moved downstairs and restored to its original place of honour over the main mantelpiece. And so it was completely a coincidence. You you happened to be visiting this National Trust property one day and you noticed the painting. And yes, noticed... completely by chance. And uh, because the painting is rather dark and melancholy, this little bright spot, which is the uh, title page, stands out, uh, jumps out at you. And if you happen to uh, know that drawing, that frontispiece, why it's evident. 
And can you tell us, before we get into the detail, which, which I know we're going to talk um, a lot more about later, can you just um, tell our listeners a bit about the structure of the book? Because I found it really, really fascinating. I mean, it's incredibly erudite and full of um, interesting things, but I really like the way you structured it. It's very unusual. So can you just explain that, please? Yes, it's unusual because it's put together by a number of mosaics, bits and pieces, if you prefer, because the quest to find the audience necessarily required looking at a lot of possibilities to where uh, people might have obtained their information about Galileo, about astronomy, about cosmology, what you will. Uh, so, so part of the book has to do with a uh, search for, I should say, the results of my ransacking of literature on all sorts of things, poems, plays, masks, sermons, uh, almanacs, whatever, to establish uh, an audience. Secondly, uh, there is the question of the uh, antecedents of the participants, the sitters, for example, and the man who commissioned the painting, who was a leading lawyer and a government official of the time, Sir John Banks. So I had to learn something about the law. I had to learn something about uh, medicine at the time because of the two sitters in the painting. One is a doctor. And uh, the painter who began his career in Denmark, there left most of his important paintings, uh, required, of course, uh, a trip to Denmark. And so... Yeah, well, that was one of the things that struck me um, and that I found most compelling was the the connections between all these different people and the connections with James I and and then Denmark, of course, his wife, he, um, Anne, he went to Denmark and spent time there. He met Tycho Brahe. I, I just found that absolutely fascinating that this world, this sort of European 17th century world was so, so interconnected. Yes. And uh, I was surprised, too, at the, at the interconnection among all the people uh, in England and their awareness of the uh, doings in Italy. And uh, it's not only Galileo, uh, but a couple of Galileo's buddies from Venice. Galileo taught in Venice for Padua, the university town of Venice, for 18 years or so. And uh, he came into contact with a lot of intellectuals in uh, Venice. And some of these guys were uh, more dangerous than he to established opinions and ideas. And they were known in England. Uh, and in fact, were wooed by uh, James and uh, others. Uh, so an investigation of the situation in, in Italy and the connections, uh, which were multi, uh, multifarious between mm. uh, Italy and uh, England, are, are in the book uh, or studied in the book. Painting, of course, connections there. The painter of our painting uh, had experience in Italy. The doctor uh, in the painting uh, also had finished his education in Italy. So there are connections abroad that you might not think of uh, at first when you are come across this uh, painting. There's obviously a great English significance in England. There's so much to talk about, but I think before we go any further, it might be helpful if you could very, very briefly, just explain about the significance of Galileo and this particular book, this particular text, which is featured in the painting. Uh, well, I can tell you about the significance of the text that's uh, featured in the painting, uh, what it meant to everybody involved. The text itself is an extraordinary work. It's The English uh, title is a uh, dialogue on the two chief world systems. And it is, it purports to be an even-handed evaluation of the geocentric system, the Ptolemaic system in which the earth stands still in the center and the sun and everything else goes round, uh, and the Copernican uh, system in which, of course, the earth and the uh, sun are interchanged. Uh, this book got Galileo into lots of trouble uh, because he had been told not to teach that theory teach the Copernican theory, and the Inquisition worked out that his, uh, despite what he said, uh, his uh, handling of the two systems was not equitable, uh, that he favored the uh, Copernican and therefore had violated this injunction made to him or this order given him 15 years earlier uh, not to have anything to do with it. But the book is not just about astronomy or cosmology. The book is about everything. It's a genre we don't have anymore. It's 
Yeah, it seems seems like a, a strange idea to have scientific information being presented in the form of a dialogue. I mean, that that's very foreign in, in the modern. World, At the time, it? of course, the dialogue was not a foreign form for. Instance, I think, <clears throat> but what is strange about it is that it is full of these uh, jokes and uh, exaggerations and um, what should I say? Uh, strange things that uh, it's hard to believe that Galileo believed. He himself calls it a, uh, refers to it frequently as a comedy. And he had tried his hand at writing comedies. I wouldn't say it's a joke book. I wouldn't say it's just anything you would uh, curl up to in the hope of continuous merriment. But <laughs> there, are, there are many uh, parts of the book that are quite entertaining. Yeah. And he's able to mix his instruction with, uh, with this sort of more general uh, literature, if you will. And do you think he was doing that partly in order to obscure his, um, you know, controversial scientific ideas? Or, or well, I don't think I think he thought it would, would make the book appealing, which indeed it does. Uh, and uh, uh, he had many things he wanted to express by developing his ideas through the eyes of the three persons of the dialogue. Uh, and one of these persons is a spokesman for himself. And he's a guy who's a he's a heavy of the piece. Yeah. And uh, then there's a, a fellow who uh, represents the sort of commonsensical person, uh, and uh, he is uh, correcting or praising or whatever the dictates of uh, the Galileo person. And then there's the only real gentleman in the whole story who's called Simplicio, who is, uh, represents the old philosophy. Yeah, the fool. But he's a nice guy. <clears throat> they, they, they treat him terribly uh, as an idiot for not knowing mathematics and for uh, being a slave to Aristotle and so on. Yeah. He, takes it, he takes it all. Yeah. And uh, occasionally he's able to uh, make a rejoinder. But generally speaking, he's the butt of the piece. Right. And, and that's supposed to add to the fun of it, too, and may be part of the explanation why we find it's not so oppressively scientific. Yeah. Sounds like a great idea. Maybe children's science textbooks could be written like that. These it, days it, it's a it's a great book. However, it does have the Italian style of the 17th century, which is not the way one writes today. No, fair enough. OK, well, I think um, now I will go, I'm going to ask you which year you would like to travel back to in time. Yes, I, I picked the date, the year of the uh, painting, which is 1643. Yep. And can you set the scene for us? What What is happening um, in, because we're going to be in England. We've been talking a lot about things that have been happening in Europe. Can you just um, explain a bit about what's going on? Because this is a very, very dramatic moment or, or period in English history, isn't it? Yes. The uh, English Civil War, the first big engagement in the English Civil War was the, uh, uh, what, October of 1642, after which the uh, king... Charles I withdrew to Oxford, where he set up his court. But we're in the middle, at the time of this painting, we're in the middle of a civil war, a really ugly contest. And uh, of course, uh, people were appropriately depressed or enthusiastic, depending upon which direction you thought the war was going. <laughs> this is a very big topic on which uh, uh, library shelves have been. Of course, written. but it's a period of great change, and people are changing sides, and it's. Let's see. We should we should give names to some of these people now. Yes. The uh, boy in the picture, as I say, there's a, a, a student uh, whose name is John Banks, K E S Banks, and his teacher, tutor, doctor, who, whose name is Maurice Williams. And uh, I should also mention the name of the painter, which is uh, Francis Klein, mm -hmm. spelled usually in English C-L-Y-N-E. And the person who paid for the whole thing and commissioned it and very likely uh, had a, the most important influence on the content of the painting uh, was the father of the boy in it, and that was Sir John Banks, uh, who was the, uh, well, at the time of the painting, he was a chief justice of uh, Common Pleas. So a very top lawyer and a member of the, of, of the Privy Council. Yeah. He was close to Charles, uh, the king, uh, who consulted him on all kinds of matters, legal matters, and whom he, Banks, tried to influence to, towards compromise with Parliament. Yeah, he tried to stop the war from starting, didn't he? And he had good credentials because before coming over to the King's service, he was a 
opposition MP. Uh, and so he, he retained that connection with parliament, at least the respect of parliament. And so both sides trusted him and you know, he was making a little bit of progress uh, towards bringing the king around, but the king listened to other people too. And uh, yeah, it didn't work out. Okay, so let's go to our first scene. We are in Oxford, as you said. Can you describe where where, where we are, what we're doing? Well, we're in Oxford. Uh, the first first scene uh, is the arrival of Sir John Banks, who, in his capacity as Chief uh, uh, Justice, uh, was in London, attending partly to his court work and partly to his obligation to advise the House of Lords. He was summoned to Oxford to join the King, which he duly did. And he found a scene which was uh, uh, somewhat off-putting, Oxford being overcrowded all the time, but then terribly overcrowded. Uh, they had about, uh, I think, a third more. The population increased by about a third with the uh, courtiers. and. Uh, so it was the king's capital, wasn't it? For, it for was the... the king's capital, but not only did he have, uh, eventually, not immediately, in the beginning of January, but he had uh, eventually during the course of uh, uh, 1643, uh, members of parliament, uh, uh, peers, cavaliers, army people, suppliers, hangers on, you know, whatever you want was there. And yeah. these were not people customarily uh, in Oxford. And so to some people that was quite exciting, to others extremely depressing. And the overcrowding consequent on the their, their parents there led to the usual problems, plague, filth, disease, corruption, whatever. Yeah, your description of it was quite um, quite dark. And the, 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 <laughs> the, the university buildings were turned to uh, uh, war use, uh, you know, the ammunition storage. I think Christchurch was an armory. Yeah, and they had the parliament in one of the Bodleian library. Parliament was, the divinity uh, yes, schools, and, uh, and worse of all for absolutely worst of all there were women that were in the colleges <laughs> <laughs> shocking shocking um okay so J john banks senior sir john banks um arrives in oxford in his official capacity um and finds this scene of um chaos and and then and so he he begins he's advising the king they're holding parliaments and um if we go to scene two this is a little bit later in the summer of the same year and um john banks's son yes uh, john banks jr comes uh, matriculated i think in july of so even while there's all this chaos and the whole court is in the city, students are still studying still and, there, and uh, learning. Gradually during the year and, of course, uh, the following year, uh, attendance fell off, as you might well imagine. But uh, young banks stayed there through 1643 and even through 1644. This is known because, fortunately, uh, their college, uh, both uh, John Banks and Maurice Williams were at Oriel, Williams as a fellow, their uh, Oriole has uh, retained the uh, buttery books for the time, so I can follow them. Explain what they are, buttery books. Oh, the buttery what? books are essentially the uh, bills run up uh, for food. So you know where Ooh. they are, uh, not only how often they eat, but what they eat. That's a great um, source of information. How fascinating. And what kind of thing was um, the young John Banks eating on a daily basis? The usual stuff. The interesting thing about it is that uh, he was, as you can tell from the picture, not a very robust young man. So he took many of his uh, meals in his room. And I, I must confess, I've forgotten just what he had for dinner. <laughs> And do you think he, he he must have been seeing his father, presumably? Uh, I, mean, I think his father may have had room at Oriel, but certainly at Chrysler. So they're, they're uh, close together. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yes, he certainly saw his father. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the father, uh, having thrown in his lot finally with the king, was ultimately censured, in fact, charged with high treason by parliament. And this was a terrific blow, a tremendous blow to... Uh, the father, Sir John, and uh, he died. Uh, I don't think he died of the plague. I think he died of just a broken heart, a broken heart or whatnot in to the end of 1644. Yeah. Um, OK, so can you tell us a bit about the um, tutor, John Banks's tutor, because he, he obviously he's the other figure in the painting and he is he in the same college? He was he was a fellow of Oriel. 
he had uh, his undergraduate college was St. John's. And uh, after that, he practiced medicine a bit. And then he went off to Italy, which had one of the most famous medical schools in Europe at the University of Padua, which was the university in which Galileo had taught mathematics, uh, what, 20 years before Williams arrived there. And Williams took a great interest in Galileo's work. You will not find very much about Maurice Williams if you look in the standard uh, biographies of the or literature of the time, uh, because mm. he uh, didn't write anything <laughs> uh, no. a, apart from a poem or two that I've been able to find that has been published. But he left a big wad of manuscripts that are now in the British Library. And as far as I can make out, nobody's ever looked at them. And they're fascinating. Tell us about them. What do they, what, what are they? Are they about astronomy or? No, well, uh, they're, they're about, there's stuff about medicine, uh, alchemy and so on. But what fascinated me was uh, stuff about uh, arguments with Francis Bacon. <gasps> oh. that, that is arguments on paper with Francis Bacon. I don't know that they ever met. It was certainly chronologically possible. Yeah. So, so uh, Williams takes on various texts of Bacon and uh, he uh, essentially carries on a dialogue with them. And sometimes he agrees, sometimes he doesn't. His objections are always well taken. There are two particular items of Bacon that he takes on. One is Bacon's views of medicine and he just devastates Bacon on that. The other are Bacon's notions of what he called the heavy and the light, that is gravity and levity. And here he brings in Galileo, that is Williams brings in Galileo in trying to answer the questions that uh, Bacon was pro so prolific in posing about uh, physical matters. And those I've tried to work into the uh, book, his interactions with Bacon into the book. And these were private papers, so they weren't they weren't published to your knowledge? No, they never published. They were they're just sitting there in the uh, British Library waiting for somebody to stumble over. And so do you think it was Williams who um, suggested putting the copy of Galileo in the painting? This is a possibility. <laughs> That's right. Another possibility is that uh, young John, who was uh, sufficiently melancholy to be a mathematician, this is not uh, any insult to mathematicians, but rather I'm following only strict 17th century doctrine in saying that uh, among the greatest melancholics in the world are mathematicians. And uh, if you wish to discover one, just look at his horoscope and you will find Saturn in a prominent position. Well, I've taken the trouble of casting young John's horoscope because I didn't know anything else about him except his date and place of birth. And so I find out, guess what? Uh, Saturn, Saturn is right there. Big in his horoscope, very, very big. One cannot uh, avoid astrology if one wants to study no, no. seriously the uh, period. And so there are a lot of astrologers <laughs> wandering around Oxford at the time. Yeah. And uh, and also around London, uh, each casting uh, horoscopes or uh, outcomes for the side he favored. Of course. And also in medicine. And I think that's one of the really difficult leaps that you have to make when you're thinking about this period and earlier is how what how profoundly people believe that the stars really did influence their um, their daily lives. And that is one very important route by which people became acquainted with these basic astronomical... Yeah, of course, yeah. That, that then served them to, uh, if, if they should have encountered uh, Galileo or this this painting and so on, that people's notion now of astrology is the garbage they read in the newspapers, not... Yeah, but it's isn't that interesting that it's still there? Even in the 21st century, you can still look up, you know, I'm Aquarius. I can still go and look that up every day. And you see. can, but of course, as we know, that's plain garbage, whereas the true... Well, yeah, but you say that, but some people still believe it. And, and it's, it, it obviously... No, no, I, I meant not that it was particular, not that it's garbage, though I believe it is, as a so-called science. That yeah. The real science of astrology works with much, much more than the sun's position, which yeah. is what you have in the, the, the newspaper sure. astrology. And so that's how young John Banks uh, could, could have Saturn in his horoscope. He didn't even care about the sun. Yeah, of course. And this was a very interesting period for the, for astronomy and astrology, wasn't it? Because I mean, it's quite complicated to explain it quickly, but the, the, the up, up until around this time, the two subjects were basically very much part of the same. They weren't really it, it's considered separate. 
But this starts to happen, doesn't it, around this time? Well, I think that's a, a question that uh, is, is not quite so readily disposed of because, after all, the whole story in the early modern England goes back to Ptolemy and uh, mm. Mm, yeah. astronomy. And Ptolemy wrote two books, one on a, well, he wrote a lot of books, but two pertinence here. And they are, one, his severe astronomy, and the other his astrology, and he kept them separate. So by the time you get to the 17th century, you know there are a lot of astronomers who don't care for astrology. Sure, but maybe a better way of putting it is that until uh, around the Renaissance, astronomers' job was not to talk about how the universe works, or th that was very much the province of natural philosophy. And it was this, this was the moment when astronomers started to astronomy was elevated effectively and sort of separated from judicial astrology and, and astronomers started to really speculate on um, and investigate how the universe functioned. And that this whole thing with Galileo and Copernicus is all part of that, isn't it? And the move away from Aristotle. Oh, yes, uh, I agree with all that. Only I would say that there's another bit that is uh, part of the uh, astronomy story, which was calculating uh, the positions of the planets uh, for various purposes, uh, medical, for example. Uh, yeah. So on. And uh, eventually for navigation and that uh, this was mathematics it's as you quite rightly say this was not about cosmology it was about uh, calculation for practical purposes i think that's wonderful that you've cast this horoscope that's so i mean that's really getting back to history as it, it should well he was done. interested in 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 uh, astronomy that we know and so many of the props there may merely be illustrative of his uh, interests and uh, uh, university career because remember it's this is a sort of a keepsake painting and mm. uh, it's probably, and, and so Sir uh, Young John's interests are represented there. That may be the reason. It may be that uh, Galileo had died then only recently. Yeah. And it could be a commemoration of Galileo because uh, although be we don't things. know very much about a Young John, we know a lot about his mother as well as about his father because of course, Sir John's papers are all over the place. Uh, uh, yeah. As attorney general, that would... Yeah, right. But the mother, uh, Lady Mary, who was a very famous person in her day because uh, she single, well, not single-handedly, but with the aid of her daughters and maidservants, beat off two sieges of the family castle at uh, Corf in uh, Dorset. And uh, this is a very famous scene, which you were a very famous story. And that was going on at the same time. The first siege of Corf Castle was in the summer, uh, I think, fall of uh, 1643. So among the things that could make uh, young John Melancholy was not only Saturn and his horoscope, <laughs> the fact that the parliamentary armies are trying to destroy the family home. Yes, and I guess all his the mother men... and sister are down there, essentially a garrison. Yeah, because the men of, are all in Oxford um, surrounding the king. Right, exactly. Uh, and uh, so that's going on too. And Yeah, that's an amazing story. And I think I've, I've, I've heard other stories of other, other families where that happened. And presumably there were lots of castles all over the country at that point who were being run by the wives and the daughters. That's right. And while we're on the subject of heroic women, at just about the time uh, that uh, young John matriculated, uh, Henrietta Maria the queen <clears throat> arrived arrived back in oxford with 150 carriage loads full of ammunition which she had bought on the continent by hawking her jewels and uh, she had had to winter over in york before bringing her carriages to uh yeah didn't she have to dodge some um cannonballs on her way she just got back to england ahead of uh, five or so uh, parliamentary ships that were pursuing her and shelled her and do you think that characterization of, of her as being the kind of pushy, brave leader figure and her husband, Charles I, as being this rather indecisive, hopeless? You wouldn't want man. me to express an opinion on that, would you? Well, I think so. Yeah, I think I think our listeners would like to know if you agree with I that. I think that's true. He, she was decisive and determined. And uh, one of his prevailing sins was uh, indecisiveness. Mm. Interesting. I should say prevailing weaknesses uh, was was indecisiveness. Yeah, he had many strengths too, which we needn't uh, perhaps. 
No, he had great taste in art and, and that kind of thing, didn't he? Well, he, he yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Hello, it's Artemis. At Travels Through Time, we're incredibly proud to be partnering with Jordan Lloyd and Colograph. Jordan is one of the world's leading visual historians. Through his excellent craftsmanship, he brings black and white photographs of the past to life in startling colour and clarity. Jordan's extraordinary work, as well as that of his contemporaries, can be found on the website colograph.co. At colorgraph.co, you'll be able to explore the process and history behind the colorization work, but most excitingly of all, you can also buy some of these beautiful photographs as museum grade fine art prints. They make an unusual and striking present for that friend or family member of yours who loves the past, and they're an excellent addition to any room. Whether it's a colorized photograph of the US Capitol building from 1846, or a candid shot of the Beatles from 1964, you're pretty sure to find something that enchants you. I know I certainly have many times. It's hard to explain really over audio just how cool these prints are, so I encourage you to have a look for yourself at colorgraph.co. What's more, Travels Through Time listeners get 10% off when they enter the code TTT at the checkout. Fascinating, thank you. Okay, let's let's move on to scene three. Scene three is when the... The most important person <laughs> in <laughs> painting appears, which is the painter. The talent arrives. The, 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 yes, Francis Klein arrives. Francis Klein is as interesting a character as you might uh, want to come across. He was a German by uh, birth, uh, studied, we don't know exactly where. His father was its, probably a goldsmith, and he learned all kinds of trades, uh, artistic trades. He could do anything. Uh, and uh, he was uh, eventually recruited by the king of Denmark, who was the, uh, well, who was the brother-in-law yeah. of James I. He was sent by the, the Christian IV, the king of Denmark, to Italy to study. And he was there for four years or so. And he was there when Galileo first got into trouble with the Inquisition in 16... 16. Uh, and it looks like he was not only a student of art, but also a, what did they then call them? Intelligencers, that is to say. A spy. Of a certain kind. Uh, did not, not that they necessarily bought information, uh, 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 but uh, that they kept their eyes open. Yeah. And informed their uh, patrons. So here is uh, Klein, who's a very good painter, and not only a painter, but a, uh, or as I'll say in a minute, a uh, jack of all artistic trades, uh, went back to Denmark, and there he painted uh, uh, great canvases, great in the sense of large, if not of ultimate artistic importance, uh, for the walls of the various palaces that uh, Christian IV was then decorating. And he then became, I'm not quite sure, he visited uh, England, and then he went back to Denmark. And this was a time at which James and Charles were trying to get loans uh, from uh, uh, the King of Denmark to carry on various wars they were thinking of prosecuting. So he probably was a bit of a go-between uh, yeah. as well as an intelligencer. Uh, and then he ended up in England to be the head of the tapestry works that uh, Charles particular uh, was uh, patronizing. And this was set up in the uh, former uh, library and yeah, of, I, your, of your good friend, John Dee. I know, I couldn't believe that. That, that was, yeah, am an amazing connection. Right, whose spirit lingered on there as I think I... Very much so, very much so. So, so there he is living it around uh, John D. He's, dec he's designing high-end tapestries because, oddly enough, this uh, English uh, works made tapestries uh, at their best, which were competitive with the finest in Europe. Then comes the uh, Civil War and uh, tapestry market goes to hell. And uh, he uh, has to find other ways to make a living. He had gone into book illustration a little bit uh, before the war came. And during the war, that's what he did. He illustrated many books. Uh, well, he made many illustrations for a few books, I should rather say. And these run into the hundreds. If you look wow. him up in the British Museum uh, uh, website, you'll find hundreds of uh, references to him because of all these uh, illustrations for books that he made. 
How interesting. And do you think lots of artists were doing that at that time as a way of keeping things? Well, he, he had a particular reputation as one who was able to tell stories at several levels in the same illustration. So he, he was... He was talented. Very well regarded. And, and uh, he is supposed to have raised the level of, uh, of English uh, illustration, book illustration, considerably. So that was, then he then comes to the, the real the shooting war and the presence of all these cavaliers in uh, Oxford who uh, need their picture painted before they get blown up. Yeah, I love, I like that particular image that you put in the book about them all needing to be immortalized on canvas. He and a student of his, uh, William Dobson, who was a famous portrait painter, I think they joined forces. Klein was available at this point when uh, Sir John Banks needed a painter to paint his son and, and Williams. So all of them are there. Yeah. So then the question is, what are you going to put in the painting besides <laughs> the sitters? Do you know where it was painted? I don't. I think <laughs> that, uh, that uh, there are two obvious possibilities. One is Oriel. Mm. And the other is uh, Dobson's studio. Okay, so Dobson had set up a studio in Oxford. And there are many paintings of Cavaliers by him that are often shown. There are some that are in the Tate, in the, right. I mean, the old Tate. <laughs> yeah, I know, Tate, England. Um, okay, so tell us about the painting. So, so th there is a connection already, isn't there, between the artist and Sir John Banks, because you, you suggest that perhaps he was helping him to get paid? Was well, there, there was a connection because uh, the Mortlake tapestry works at first were, uh, though patronized by the king, Charles, uh, what did not belong to him. But uh, towards the end of the 1630s, he took it over. And that required a lot of paperwork. And the paperwork fell to the attorney general, who was Sir John yeah. Banks. And so uh, he, Banks, uh, had to uh, draw up the contracts for Klein, and so knew him and knew his work. Yeah, I think that was an important connection. And so um, he commissions the portrait, and then we have this slightly speculative process, which we're guessing at, of them deciding what's going to be... I mean, obviously, we're going to have a picture. The, the portrait will be up on the website so that um, people can go and have a look at it. But do you want to just just describe it a bit, talk a little bit about it? It it's looks as if uh, the doctor is trying to interest him in this. Yeah. As someone who's currently homeschooling their children, I, I do very, very much identify with the look on the... on. <laughs> Francis's face, yeah. So uh, what's to amuse the uh, the boy, this uh, Saturnine boy, uh, who has some interest, we think, in mathematics. And so the props in the picture are a telescope, which looks a little bit like a nautical chart, a rolled up chart, but it is a telescope, uh, one that, a draw telescope, which can open further. There is a, a globe, which is a usual feature, as often seen in paintings of the time. And then there are the two books. There is the open book that we know about, the Galileo, and then there is a closed book about which uh, something might be said later. There are a few smaller artifacts. For example, there's a compass that's held, John Banks holds in his hand, uh, which shows that he is almost awake, <laughs> that he is he hasn't dropped the compass. He is... Uh, uh, he looks like he might drop it, though. It's not... <laughs> drop it, and he might not. So the, the question is whether he will wake up and uh, be a uh, contributor to uh, to life. Like his dad, um, yeah. Like his dad, or whether he's going to just be a complete lump. And what happened? What, did, what did, did he did he contribute? Did he wake up? Did he... Well, this is a good question. Uh, he did wake up, yes. His father's direction in the will and his will were that uh, John Banks, until the age of 25, I think, had either to stay at the university or go or join the Inns of Court or go traveling. Uh, John Banks or his mother uh, said, you're going traveling. Mm. And we have a travel diary of his, okay. uh, which incidentally he kept in French. From that, you can infer that he had awakened. Yes, yeah, and that he could speak good French. And, and other, yes, he, he awakened to other things that I think are not known particularly to uh, undergraduates at Oxford. <laughs> these, are, these are the props in the picture, and uh, but what do they mean? And uh, why is Galileo really there? And so I must confess uh, that I don't know the answer to this question. I have too many answers to this question. And so the last chapter of the book is arranged as a dialogue 
among in the best Galilean manner that yes. I could manage. Oh, there is many jokes. If you work hard at it, yeah, <laughs> there's even more. Uh, and and uh, the, the 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 interlocutors are uh, the painter and the two sitters. Yes. And just as uh, in Galileo's dialogue, Galileo is just off stage. Okay. So in this dialogue, Sir John Banks is just off stage. I think that's a great idea. That's a fantastic way of presenting your conclusions. Right. So then they discuss what it meant to them at the time of the painting and what it means to them now, which is 10 years after the uh, event. Yeah. And uh, there are many interesting, they have some interesting things to say about this painting. Uh, and I must say that when I wrote it, I was just taking dictation. I didn't invent anything at all. They just spoke to me. Really? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And uh, so it's uh, overly, uh, what should I say, uh, determined. There are several, uh, but non non conflicting significances. And had you ever written anything like that before? Well, yes, but not published. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. I just think it's interesting because, you know, you've spent your, your whole career writing these very, very um, highbrow, complex books about the history of science. And then this is this is quite a departure. And I think and it's a really it's a brilliant way of presenting the information. I, I thank you for that. Then I, I must add that Galileo's image has been exploited for centuries. I think that uh, Klein's picture is perhaps the first uh, outside of portraiture a rendition of Galileo for some purpose. Yeah. But uh, in a little postscript, I point out uh, just the the breadth of uh, exploitation and uh, obvious things, foodstuffs, for everything from salami to uh, chocolates has been uh, advertised and sold under with some reference to Galileo. But also, politically speaking, I was amazed to find uh, not that he was. Uh, you know, the, the image, the exemplar of suffering in the cause of, uh, of uh, spe free speech or academic freedom, but that the Nazis invoked him on their side uh, in the uh, Mussolini uh, uh, Hitler pact uh, or, or meetings. Uh, the Galileo and Kepler were together taken as the bonds between these two fascist countries. So that's appalling, but not surprising either. Exactly. So it's a long story that begins with Klein. Well, it's fascinating, really fascinating. Much more benign than it, uh, it, than it became. Yeah. Um, well, I think there's only one question left that I need to ask you. Um, and that is that if you could have um, picked something up from one of these three scenes when you were there um, and brought it back to the present with you, what, what would it have been? It's obvious I'd have taken the painting. But if they wouldn't let me have the painting, I would take three copies of the original edition. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> They'd be, yes. Good and choice. They're now, they're now going for over a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure you would have kept them, though, in your own private library, wouldn't you? Sold the other two and kept one. Um, oh, that's great. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank hey. you. It was a very pleasant conversation. That was Professor John Harbron talking to Violet Muller about the year 1643 and the story contained in his fascinating new book, The Ghost of Galileo, and a forgotten painting from the English Civil War, which has recently been issued in hardback by Oxford University Press. To see the painting itself, do head to our episode page on our website, tttpodcast.com. You'll find it featured there along with lots more about the characters and the historical period that we explore in this episode. As ever, thanks for listening to the second episode of our new season. We'll be back next Tuesday with another adventure in the past. But for now from us, that's it. Goodbye. <laughs>